Hey, this is Indy's car insurance. Do you have a minute to talk? You're welcome to try. Welcome to another episode of Horses with Horns. My name is Indranel. I'm Nicholas. And today, we're talking sales. Today, we're going to go through identifying your customers, figuring out who you're even talking to and why you should be talking to them. Then we're going to talk about how you get in contact with them. And also, of course, pretty importantly, we're going to talk about closing them and getting that check. So tell me, how oh. do you figure out who your customers are? Uh, this is a, you know, sales is, man. like It is rough. <laughs> yeah, that is very difficult. You know, the way that I've uh, described it before, um, it's going from shooting penalties in soccer and scoring 80% of them, as most players do, and then saying, I'm going to go bat, and then only getting one in a million home runs or something like that. You know, it's 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 it changes significantly. So you, you have to get comfortable with uh, many, many, many rejections to get to that one approval. It's just you're playing a much different numbers game now. But anyway, um, that being said, how do you identify the customers? Well, first of all, uh, there's a big distinction, I think, between if your business is B2B or if your business is B2C. Um, it is um, kind of well understood, I think, that even before you start thinking about who my customers are, and when I, when I uh, say who, I mean first and last name, very exactly. But it is well understood to have a built-in profile and audience and not just a profile in that type of person that you're looking for it could be if it's b2b it could be title it could be company industry right b2c it could be interest uh age ranges demographics geographics um but before those two things having an audience right just having the ear and having the attention of these people um Podcast could be one of those things, right? But anyway, how do you identify your customers? If you're doing B2B, I think LinkedIn is widely used. I do think very frequently, you know, if everyone's doing it, it's probably not the best way to do it. It's probably the most accessible way to do it, but it probably not the best. I've been thinking about that. I don't know if anyone knows if there's another LinkedIn option, uh, alternative to uh, figuring out who you need to talk to. Feel free to drop it in the comments. Uh, LinkedIn is widely uh, used for B2B. For B2C, I think social media groups, um, Facebook, Instagram. I'm actually very surprised. You know, I've, I've stopped using Facebook um, for posting uh, purposes for many years. I but have no idea the last time I posted on Facebook. Uh, I barely post on Instagram anymore either. Same here. It's been a long time. But I am very surprised at how active the Facebook groups are. Uh, Facebook yeah. groups is something that I've, I've been... Um, surprised about that it's 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 they're they're very active and it's very much a group of people talking about a particular type of particular topic something brings these people together so for b2c definitely um groups yeah definitely so i think we're already getting a little tactical on identifying platforms but i think when we think about sales one of the common ways to set things up and a framework that works for most companies and people is a funnel like really understanding that you have the entirety of the world that is out there that you could reach out to and then narrowing it further down of getting people interested, actually reaching out to them and so on. But let's talk a little bit more at the top of understanding that your customers are not actually the entire world. When you're identifying your customers, it's actually already a pared down subset. Yeah, for sure. That's what I mean by audience, right? Yep. You already have this profile of who you're looking for. Best example that comes to my head right now, not the prettiest, but just because you sell toilet paper doesn't mean you should reach out to everybody. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a product that you can easily justify that everybody needs. And it is true, but from a selling effort and especially... Um, 
differentiation how can you compare to charming how can you compare like why why would someone switch why would someone that's already using some brand switch to your new brand right so you have to choose a more specific target uh, audience even if the product could theoretically be used by everybody um the very um very famous example of that is poopery i don't know how many people know that yeah so they you know they basically everyone goes to the bathroom right so everyone needs it but they couldn't sell as much as they are selling now till they decided, you know, the packaging, the branding, the commercials, everything's going to be geared to our younger women. And that allowed uh, sales to actually happen. Okay. So they realized that even though the entire world, in theory, could use their product, they identified that there's this one group that makes most sense for them. Without any changes to the product. Uh, and that's very interesting, right? That... Even if your product could potentially be used by anyone, um, that doesn't mean that your sales process should be for everybody. Right. Because if you're trying to sell to everyone, this actually kind of goes to our last episode about pitching and pitching effectively. You have to start with what audience makes most sense for you and where you're at at that time. And really just focusing on what can you deliver for that group. So. Pick Mm -hmm. your group, understand what you can deliver for them, and kind of bringing it back into the software world. That's what we did when we were selling recruiting products. It was, Mm -hmm. yes, in theory, you can sell a recruiting product to any company that's hiring, but there are so many different groups within that of SMBs, enterprise companies, seed state startups, all the way to like the Facebook size companies. Right. And in recruiting specifically, right, you're also subject to the job seekers if you start to sell to everybody to every company say in many different cities now you have to start worrying about uh, segmentation for your job seekers not everybody's willing to move and things start to come up that uh, is not a perfect fit anymore one thing that i would like to highlight about identifying your customers too is that um, especially for the people that are doing b2b i don't think you should ever position your pitch or your um, your sales process thinking of companies. Yes, companies is who you're selling to. Um, you're selling to people that work at companies. Ultimately, it is who at the company. Many times, uh, especially in the past, I, I caught myself offering and talking to someone, say the director of finance, and talking to someone that the company needs But this person has a job. This person's responsible for doing things. Yeah, a good employee is supposed to care about the company as a whole and whatnot. But this person will proceed and talk to you more if you're talking um, something that's very relevant. And just because you're B2B, it doesn't mean you're selling to companies. You're selling to people at companies. Right. That makes sense. Where... Again, using this recruiting company example, because it's most directly what I've experienced with on selling, but it wasn't good enough to say that our product works best for series B through D companies. That was true, and that is one step of narrowing the top of the funnel, but we got even tighter there where it was, okay, directors of recruiting makes most sense. Mm -hmm. Potentially HR people, but not really. Right. And actually, sometimes directly to the engineering team or maybe even finance, you know, if you can compete on price, you're pitching that. But I think really the the main theme here is understanding what you are able to sell and sell on. Like, what, what are the features of your product that are attractive to who you're selling to that can help you narrow down your customer? Right. And many people do it from, and I, and I think it's recommended to do it from the other angle, actually, right? To go from audience to product to always say, well, who are we selling to? And then let's position the product, let's position the service to attend to that specific need of that specific group. I think it's easier to identify who you're going after um, and then say, hey, let's um, um, make changes if it's not an exact fit. Sorry, let me mute my computer. Let's make changes if it's not an exact fit. I, I, that's easier than um, going for, um, you know, changing 
coming up with a service, coming up with a product, and then trying to see who that ends up fitting with perfectly. Right. Yeah, because again, if you're trying to sell to everyone, or maybe you don't even know who your product actually fits for, you're probably not going to get super targeted. Right. But, you know, for founders, and this is something that I faced myself, um, when you're just getting started, you're at the ideation, and you're also at the, at the selling. And it's, and it's important to separate those two actions, right? Because for every time that you pitch and it's not successful, if you start thinking about changing your services and changing what your business is doing immediately, don't. Take a break, pitch again, go after someone else. Do that, take all that feedback and basically give it to the other side of your brain that's thinking about the offering. But um, don't, um, don't do both at, at the same time. It's not productive for either side. Yeah, for sure. Now, all of this is contingent on actually talking to people. <laughs> We've kind of assumed that, okay, you're going to pitch them, you're going to get some feedback, but that's not how most sales work. Most sales, you don't even actually get to talk to the people you want to talk to. So oh yeah, how do you fix that? How do you get in front of them? Okay, so... I know that many people in sales talk about sequences, right? And they talk about emailing and sending the email day one, sending an email again day three, and then calling, LinkedIn connecting, um, a sequence of steps, right? I think for organizational purposes, that is useful, just so that you know you're going after uh, people that you think are a good fit for your business that you're going after them enough frequently that they're always hearing from you. But externally, I don't think many people realize, oh, this guy's emailing me for the fifth time. Or um, there's no recognition of the sequence just uh, just as much as you have it internally. So in, in my experience, just to ballpark a few numbers, my connect, and when I say connect, I mean uh, an exchange between uh, prospect and myself. My connect uh, ratio, uh, compar comparing emails at any at any step, first email or last email or whenever, any email or any phone call, um, my connect ratio on the phone is at least four or five times better than emailing. That's interesting. This kind of goes to the whole concept of a funnel, though. Mm -hmm. You have better conversion at the... Well, actually, better let's step back. connection. Yeah, yeah not conversion. Conversion something else. <laughs> okay, yeah. so if we're still at the top here, we're, we're just trying to get connected with people, even have that first conversation. Your connect rate on the phone is better. But let's talk about conversion then. What happens from there? You've gotten in contact with them. Are you successful there? Yeah, I mean, it, that that's always, of course, difficult, right? When you get someone on the phone, you have to be... Um, you, that's when we go back to the last episode. Your pitch has to be good, right? And it's something that's going to take some time to perfect and, and, and really listen. You know, just, um, just recently, I've received feedback on what wasn't clear. Or maybe the person that you're trying to connect with doesn't tell you this is what's wrong about your pitch but they will communicate whether it's clear or not. And like the conclusion of our last episode, a good pitch is what, what makes the conversation uh, continue. So I would say that on the phone, the goal is to book a meeting where you are no longer strangers, just to present the company and the service enough to say, let's talk a little further 15 minutes is what's usual. People say that all the time, right? Let's book a 15-minute call. Um, whatever amount of time you think is needed. But to book a meeting where we're no longer strangers. I think on the phone, it's much easier to get to that point. Um, much, much easier to reject. Though I don't think because most of the phone calls that I do get to talk to someone most of them are not interested, right? Most of them end up being, I'm not interested or 
um, happy with our current services. And that's a, that's a really good time to, to find out about competitors, to find out what other people are enjoying. Or they tell you uh, insights that you didn't have before, like we don't have the budget for that. Things like that. But yeah. yeah. So I think this has actually come up a few times. So again, this is assuming you can even get in contact with people, but the sales process is truly a process. It takes time. Uh, it is far more than having a minute. If you're doing sales correctly as well, you should be spending a lot of your time on discovery. What is the actual pain point of the user? Can your product truly help them? Because not only does it help you refine your pitch and kind of slowly work on selling them, but you want to make sure that you're not wasting your own time. Sales will take that whole concept of seven touches before somebody actually buys something, right? Whether it's through marketing, sales, whatever it is, it takes a lot of time to get somebody to a yes. Yeah. And if you don't do that discovery work first of does this make sense, you can get through six or seven conversations and the person's still going to say no. Yeah. And I think as early as possible is very important to say this may work this may this may be a fit or this may not be a fit i think it's very empowering to go after a prospect saying hey it looks like we can work together i'm not sure let's check it out if it's not no problem you know let's just move on i'll find someone else to talk to and that is perfectly fine um it's there's so many things, right? The, the pitching, the, the selling process, the research, the learnings, everything is happening at the same time. Um, the expression that, actually I haven't heard it in a long time, right? But build a plane while you're flying. It, it, it's interesting because back in the day, to me, that basically meant it had an incomplete meaning. Now I get it better. Back in the day, to me, it meant, you know, we're flying, Basically, we're holding altitude, but we want to fly higher, faster. So we need to make some changes to this plane, right? Now it means we're in the air and we need to get fixed in the plane because we're falling. We're always falling unless we do something, right? Before it meant like we're, we're just holding the altitude. And if we want to get to improvements, we need to work on this, this, this and that. But but we're flying. Flying actually means we're falling, you know? Um, so sales is one of those environments where you just kind of have to, especially on the phone, where you have to bring all the tools you have immediately and, and get really good at it. Yeah, definitely. Because if somebody's giving you that time, that's actually one important thing to note as well. Sometimes on the phone, if somebody just picks up a cold call and they give you time, not always the best indicator, but especially if somebody's put time on the calendar with you, is taking a call, there's probably some basic level of interest in whatever it is you're doing. So you don't mm -hmm. want to waste that touch point because to your earlier point, if you can get somebody to talk to you, that's already amazing. It's yeah, it's pretty hard to even get that first conversation. Yeah, you know, and not contrary to what I've said, but though my connect uh, ratio on the phone is much higher, um, recently, my meetings have been, I've been able to book meetings via email, not on the phone. And I think it's because a lot of times the phone call, the cold call ends up being the, what's perceived as the meeting, you know, and it doesn't mean that calling is worse. It just means that you go through it faster. So via email, you go to that meeting you show up, whether it's a video call or it's on the phone, um, and you might still get to a no, right? So with, with calling, it just happens really fast. Sure. Ideally, though, the, the point of sales is not to get no's. Oh, yeah. No. So, <laughs> unfortunately, um, what, what are some of those things that you use to get somebody mm -hmm. to a yes? How do you convert them? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because a lot of the no's that I've uh, had over my um, cold calling sessions or emailing, a lot of them, um, I wouldn't say most of them, have been really nice about it, really nice about saying no, not needed, sorry, not now, for whatever reason, right? So I would say that 
in your discovery in in the process of getting in touch with people you're gonna have to knock on the door to see who is a no who is uh no but nice about it and who is a maybe and who is a yes and the only way to find out is to knock on the doors right so it's i don't know if i'm i'm still i mean having having a good pitch of course is a great place to start but a good pitch won't turn someone that's not interested into interested i don't think so i agree completely you know uh a bad pitch may turn someone that could be interested into not interested happens all the time yeah so it's more about being ready for the very few that would like to work with you yeah i agree so i think it really goes to how we started this conversation of just understanding that not everybody is interested or has a need in what you are selling and that's fine that actually saves you a lot of time Mm -hmm. so it's identifying customers who have a true demonstrated need in what you're doing doing the discovery work to confirm that of like not only do you have a need for this vague solution that i have but my product and what i can deliver right now meets those needs and you know, it doesn't have to meet all of the needs, but just enough that you can close and then spending time with them, really spending time being conversational and building that relationship with the customer of, I want to help you. Like, this is something that will be yeah. useful to this customer and I'm on their side. Yeah. I mean, think about all the calls, robo calls or legitimate sales calls that you get, right? As probably from B2C businesses or scammers right a lot of scam. Um, yeah there's a lot of scam out there so speaking from my perspective and probably many other people as well as soon as i pick up the phone let's say that it doesn't say scam likely let's say that it says some number that looks legitimate if i pick it up if it's from your area code don't pick up <laughs> if i pick it up um and i quickly realize that this is about sales and let's say that it's someone that it. It's a real person trying to sell me something, right? Just about 100% of the time, I feel like before hearing anything, before hearing their pitch, I feel this is not worthy and it's potentially uh, scamming me, right? Right. I think the default answer people are in now because of how much we get is no. Exactly. So Not even no. It's like, I don't even want to hear this hang up yeah people don't say anything they just hang up block the number whatever right so everyone's already predisposed to saying no because there is a trust component i think the first one is more on that on the legitimacy of the the ask like nowadays for instance if someone knock on your door offering you a vacuum cleaner or anything that's I'm I'm scared. I am locking that door immediately. Right, right. That just doesn't work. And I think we've hit another moment like that where calling has turned into that, right? So the, the first obstacle that you need to surpass is the, hey, I'm not here to rob you. Um, I'm a normal person and I have something that may be useful to you, you know? So that's obstacle number one. So once they trust you enough to hear the pitch, Right. And this is where I personally, uh, normally what I do, and it's been pretty good. Uh, Normally, I get a yes just about all the time. When I do talk to someone on the phone and you pick up the phone and I say, hi, Indriel, you know, this is uh, Nicholas from Exodus Consulting. How are you? You know, or uh, very quickly just saying Nicholas from Exodus Consulting. I know you're not expecting my call. I was just wondering if you had 30 seconds to hear what I have to say and how we can work together. You know, just about to get a yes almost all the time. Um, I feel because 30 seconds, you already gave this, it's just 30 seconds, right? And you're also positioning it in a way that where you can say, this may be valuable, right? So just 30 seconds. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Super tactically, how do you actually get in front of these people? I Like, I know you're calling them, but where do you get their phone numbers oh yeah okay so without pointing to a specific site 
um, I just look it up on just Google um, how to get people's phone numbers. <laughs> and there's going to be many, many sites. Uh, one of the many uh, skills that I gather in my recruiting days, right? When you think about recruiting, yeah. you're with people on both ends, right? Job seekers and hiring managers. So you're, it, the whole business is talking to people. Yeah. So speaking of that, we actually worked at our very first company together, a recruiting company. Uh, and we also worked with our guest speaker, Anthony. Yes, um, Anthony, really cool guy. You know, um, he's actually helped me a lot with uh, sales and crafting the pitch and um, making sure that it's valuable. So really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, he's really good and has had a lot of sales experience in different companies, even uh, with the family business. Um, so yeah, let's uh, take a listen to what Anthony has to say. My name is uh, Anthony DiPolito, and I've been in sales for um, a little over seven years now. And um, in terms of my startup sales uh, software experience, my first role was with um, Nick and Indy back at InterviewJet uh, starting in 2017. Uh, I then went on to work for a company called Rodeo. Um, at Rodeo, we sold a uh, project management tool for the creative uh, industry, specifically for uh, boutique creative shops. Um, the company was based out of the Netherlands and my role was to um, help to introduce the product into the United States market and specifically in New York City. And my most recent company isn't, um, I guess what you would call, or when I joined wasn't a traditional startup. Um, we were series B and in my time there, um, we got our uh, series C. Probably um, everybody in sales is, is using um, using this to, especially in the startup world, is using LinkedIn. Um, just a simple, you know, understanding of um, a company, uh, you know, company directory in terms of the layout. Um, so you're looking for specific titles, um, specific job description, um, using other tools then to verify that data, um, because not always are you going to see, um, you know, a title doesn't always match to um, the person that you need to be speaking to, but a lot of times it'll give you, um, you know, a good start into getting to who you want to speak to. Um, but we were using, and what I've used is, is ZoomInfo to, to verify the data. And when it comes to, just to go back to that, when it comes to the job description and identifying your prospect, um, title uh, itself will usually be a good start, but actually reading someone's LinkedIn profile and going through their job description and figuring out, um, you know, what their actual day to day looks like is really the best indicator as to um, if that person is the right person to speak to. And when you find the right person, uh, it's important that you then put in uh, all of your effort to make sure you get a response. Um, and just one last thing in terms of uh, identifying your prospects and clients, you also want to, um, you know, do some research on company websites. Um, again, it really depends on the size of the company, but not everybody is on LinkedIn. And so depending on your client, depending on your prospect, um, sometimes reading through a website um, will get you more accurate data, specifically if you're reaching out to like government or um, people in the education industry. Um, a lot of times they'll have um, you know, the employees listed on there with a short blurb about their background and what their role is. And that's super helpful when you're reaching out to people. Uh, in terms of process, um, I, believe it or not, my process has always been pretty much the same in, in all of my roles. Um, I like to go ahead and um, customize that initial email. And by customize, it's usually just the, the first line of the email. And I'm not talking about, I saw your title at so-and-so and this is what you're doing. It's more about like trying to introduce the problem that you think you can solve for them right away um, in, in the cold email. So saying, you know, um, things along the lines of uh, like pointing out specifics as to what you noticed with their day to day and then how that relates to, um, you know, typical problems that that you're seeing that, you know, people in their position will normally face. Um, I, I try to leave out in an initial email, I try to leave out any information really about me and about my company. Um, because most people, if you hit the problem that they're looking to face, will then go ahead and just, you know, click the link in the signature to go to your website. And that's where they're going to get the most and the best information about what it is you're doing. Um, so really just trying to make the first email all about them um, and, and then setting up uh, a typical uh, email sequence anywhere from four to, you know, 
uh, I would say initially like four to six touches. Um, and then over time, adding more touches to that list if I feel that, um, you know, the emails have been have a good open rate and, and people are interacting with the emails, then I'll add additional steps later on as something relevant, a piece of relevant information comes up that I know will fit with um, with that. I make sure that I'm calling people um, like twice a week, really. You don't want to bombard people with calls. But uh, if you know you have somebody's direct line or if you have um, cell phone information, which I know this might not be a, a topic that a lot of people feel comfortable with. Um, even in sales, I've noticed a lot of people are iffy about calling cell phone numbers. And for me, I've always felt like if that information is available and you're, you know, uh, people, I think, get nervous about calling cell phone numbers if they're not confident in the reason for reaching out and they haven't done their research. I feel like if you've done your research and you know why you're reaching out to someone and you have, you know, a very specific problem that you can help them with, um, there's really no reason to to be nervous about calling someone's cell phone because anyone who's business minded would like to receive a uh, you know a call from somebody who is identifying one of their top three problems and then providing a solution. Um, so calling like two times a week um, and then beyond that um, using LinkedIn as well, just not as uh, not as like a, a blast somebody with a message, but um, if you've already had contact with somebody or if you know this perfect if, if you know this person is perfect and you haven't been able to get them through call and email then sending them like a custom linkedin message um can sometimes move the needle as well so it's really just about being strategic not bombarding people um really thinking about how you would respond if you were on the other end would i would i respond to this message when you read it is this something that you know if i was this person would that be relevant uh, and then constantly, you know, iterating it as well and changing it based on the conversations that you're having with people. A lot of times people will tell you where you missed the mark in your cold email or you'll get a sense of uh, an actual major problem that they're dealing with. And then you can go ahead and assume that other, uh, you know, similar people to them and other companies are, are dealing with that same problem. But yeah, how to then handle uh, the meeting and then close the, the prospect and client. So um, I think this is again all going to depend on like the product and the problem that you're solving but at the end uh, you know discovery and, and truly attempting to uncover the issues that people are facing figuring out why they took the call and then um, aligning that with how your product fits and can make their lives easier um, and, and i like to instead of going through and, and i think most people um, do this but not necessarily like a canned demo but something you go through more of these specific parts of the product that they mentioned they wanted to see or that you know based on the issues that they're having um, and then uh, making sure at the end of the conversation um, especially at like a, a selling conversation and it's going to depend too because depending on your company that could be a 30 minute conversation where you get the discovery and the demo done other times a discovery can be 30 to 45 minutes on its own before you go into a demo and there's four or five people involved. So that's going to really um, be, uh, it's going to, you know, depend on the size of the company. Um, but yeah, at the end, you want to make sure you're you're setting an action plan uh, based on the date that they need to be live and, and that you have, you know, hopefully uncovered earlier in the conversation based on what they're looking to solve. Um, and then last, just if you know it's a fit, you know, restating the, the parts or restating the um, each of the the pieces that you know to them that they've mentioned um, matter to them and what's most important and reiterating how your product can can solve that if you can um, and then confidently just uh, asking for the sale and and giving your pricing and waiting to see what their what their response is and I think uh, just overall to sum it up I went a little bit longer I think than what was requested but uh, start to finish the most important thing I think is. Uh, just staying human and just remembering that while you know everything you have laid out and is laid out in an ideal process it's really not usually going to go that way and um, because again people are human and and you know they you have your process but they have theirs uh, and you want to make sure that um, you are you remain professional and, and you uh, you remember to to act accordingly and, and try to put yourself in um, your potential prospects shoes so i hope that was helpful and um yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me to to go through these questions. Anthony, thank you so much for all of your experience and uh, sharing that with us. Really valuable. Yeah, it was super great working with you. Uh, I also know I have your tennis racket, so we should play sometime. <laughs>
Yeah, there's a lot of people that need to play tennis with Andrew. Uh, yeah. Two two guests in a row that Common need to play tennis. Theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what stood out the most from what Anthony had to share? Yeah, so a couple of really insightful things that um, really stand out to me are confidence in selling, basically. Mm -hmm. So one piece that Anthony mentioned was if you have somebody's phone number and it's out there and you actually feel good about what you're talking about, don't be scared to call because... Cell phone, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the, the cell phone number. Yeah. yeah, Don't be afraid to call them. And I think that goes back to kind of two checklist items. Mm -hmm. Just confidence in general that you are calling for a reason and that you're not going to waste their time, but also that you've done some of that pre-work on discovery of narrowing down your customer pool you know that you're reaching out for a reason you think that you can help them you're not calling them to like take money from them you're calling because you can help them you know what you said reminds me of what uh, a good friend uh, also neighbor raz share with me when we were talking about cold calling he's been commenting on the videos right yeah yeah, yeah. thank you thanks he said you know, we're just talking about basically kind of concluding to how it is a numbers game heavily, right? And he said, we both were saying something you just have to push through and do and call and just kind of get it over, not get it over with, but do it, right? And then he said something that really stuck with me. He said, hey, scammers do it every day, <laughs> you know, and you're not scamming anyone. So you're honest about it. So if someone who's dishonest about this does it, then you should definitely do it. There's nothing stopping you from it. You're not doing anything wrong. Yeah, and you shouldn't feel bad about it either because, yeah, like you're saying, people who are really just trying to take money from people will call no shame all day. Nine so, to five, yeah. Nine to five. So, I mean, if you can actually build a solid relationship with somebody, help them with something and get paid for it, why not? Totally. One really good thing that Anthony shared that I've experienced myself is that people will tell you where you missed that mark. Not everybody. Most people don't uh, tell you uh, exactly what it is, but they, they kind of give you, they, they, they guide you a little bit into what wasn't clear or what they don't need, right? And you as the founder have the the position this this is good and bad uh, uh like i mentioned earlier right you you have to be careful with not thinking about the business and sales at the same time but you are in a position where you can take feedback uh quickly right so you can take that feedback to say okay this is how we're gonna sell differently this is how we're gonna fix the pitch or this is how we're gonna fix the offer yeah so i think Kind of just summing up the episode here, it really is just about finding people that you can help. You're not scamming them. You are legitimately getting to a customer pool that you have a product for them. Mm -hmm. Get in front of them however you can. Could be with LinkedIn. It can be a multi-step strategy where you, again, probably have to reach out to them five, six, seven times before you can even have a conversation. And then from there, just continue to show where you can demonstrate value. For sure. Um, one final thing that Anthony also shared that I really liked was at some point when you have that longer meeting, if your call was successful and you book a longer conversation where, you know, in my experience and many people's experience, once you put money on the table and say, OK, you like it, I like I, I like it that you like it. This is how much it would be. That's another point of uh, that's where people lose a lot of conversion. Right. A lot of people say no once it gets real. But once they say no to you, if they say no to you, I really recommend, I'm, I'm actually going to start doing this. If I call you and you say no to me, I'm also going to say, internal, I agree with you. This is, this, is not, this is not a good idea. You know, I also say no to you. Not in a, um, with no bad intentions to it. Just, I, I agree. If you don't want it, it's probably, you're right. And I agree with you on that. You yeah. know, it's it's important to 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 uh, remember that uh, they say no to you, but part of it is you saying no to them as well, and nothing wrong with that. Call the next person. Right. 
opportunity to to refine the product if necessary. And you know, if it's truly just not a fit, it's not a fit. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.